Hi everyone, Professor Sackett Taylor here. Today we're going to be talking about some more details about what makes this class a macroeconomics class and specifically looking at the primary macroeconomic measure of economic growth and well-being, GDP. This is going to be a two-part lecture, so please do make sure that you follow up with the second half after you watch this video. Previous to this, we covered four chapters, all of which were addressing the foundations of economics. We talked about how economics is the study of how people allocate their limited resources to satisfy unlimited wants and needs. Economics is a positive science. We focus on what is, not what ought to be. We use data to inform our models to look at how we could better understand the complex world around us by simplifying it and making assumptions. Macroeconomics specifically is the study of the overall aspects and the workings of an economy. It focuses on the big picture. The thing that we're going to see as a kind of takeaway from this lecture is that we have a choice or trade-off between consumption now and consumption later. And what we're going to find is that if we make investment that is save consumption for later, it leads to greater future output and economic growth. So the big questions we're going to answer today are how is how macroeconomics is different from microeconomics and what GDP can tell us about an economy. In the second half of this lecture, we'll talk about how GDP is computed and some of the shortcomings of using this model or this form of data to think about economic well-being. So microeconomics as a sub-discipline in economics really is looking at the individual behavior of households, individual people, firms, and industries. We're focusing on day-to-day decision-making on a micro scale, meaning um, a smaller scale. So one example that we might be looking at in a microeconomic context is what are the impacts of the changes in the price of wheat? However, macroeconomics is the study of the economy at an entire nation or society level. So we're gonna be looking at aggregate or um, like added up measures of economic activity and look at how firms across the country as a whole are deciding what to produce, how to produce it, where to make it, things like that. Macroeconomics is really big picture. So instead of focusing on the success or failure of like one person or one firm, we focus on overall success or failure of an entire economy. And by entire economy, we could be talking about something as large as the economy of the United States, or we could be looking at like a more modest sized economy, such as the economy of the state of Massachusetts or the economy of the city of Boston. We're looking at the income and production ability of all people in that economy and specifically concerned with output and overall prices. So this brings us to one of the core concepts in the macroeconomic side of things. This is GDP or gross domestic product. You've likely heard of this measure before, um, especially if you've ever listened to the news or specifically economic news like NPR, they're constantly comparing GDP as a measure of economic performance. It seems pretty straightforward at the outset, but it's not. Although GDP is the most widely used measure of production, um, it's, its measurement is not perfect. So we use GDP in the economics literature as a proxy for well-being, but you have to be mindful that there is a tension between using economic measures to simplify and understand the human experience. So um, this is a better model than not having one at all, although it's imperfect. It's going to measure the total, or sometimes you'll hear the gross, meaning total, amount of everything produced within a specific economy. 
And then we use that as a comparison measure to look between regions or nations. So defining it specifically, GDP is gonna function kind of like a barometer for the economy. It's the market value of all final goods and services produced within a specific country during a specific period of time. It's essentially the sum of all output from economic activity. When GDP goes up, it's implying that national output and national income are both higher. And when GDP goes down, it implies that an economy is producing less than it was before and that total national income is falling. We're gonna use output and income interchangeably. This is because when you think about output, we're using the market value of that output when measuring GDP. Market value is essentially how much of that product you produced multiplied by the price per unit. So this is the market value of the output itself, but you can think if you were selling that output and you multiplied the amount that you sold times the price you got for it, that would be the amount of income you received from those sales. So in this case, national output or the market value of national output is the same as national income. <clears throat> so let's practice what we know so far. GDP is also measuring here, not only the market value of all the production of all goods and services within a specific country, during a specific period of time, but the market value of that output is equivalent to the nation's income. So why do we want to use GDP as a measure in our economic models? So there are primarily three uses for GDP. It can help us better understand the living standard of a specific country. That is like what kind of quality of life a person might expect um, living inside of a specific economy. It also can help us measure economic growth or decline over time. And on a, in a cyclical way, we can look at a specific period of time to determine whether an economy is experiencing expansion or um, contraction, which we also call recession. So let's think first about how we use GDP to measure living standards. Now, the level of GDP might not be the most perfect measure to use as a comparison across countries because the population will vary dramatically across countries, the size of the population. Um, so if we fail to account for that variation, then we could, it could lead to some biased results. But GDP is offering us a way to estimate the living standards across both time and space. If we adjust for population differences, then we can get a more accurate picture of what the average individual in a specific economy can experience in the form of income. This is what we call per capita or per person GDP. It measures the average living standards in a nation for the average individual. Of course, this means that there are gonna be people that are much wealthier and people that are much poorer. But on average, this is going to account for um, the total wealth at, if it was distributed equally among the residents of that country. So per capita GDP is calculated as total GDP divided by the quantity of the population, the number of people. So here's an example. If we were to look just at GDP, the total market value of all goods and services produced within a country during a specific period of time. This is the um, middle column here. So in 2016, measured in billions of dollars, you could see that the GDP of the country of China was much higher than the total GDP of the country of Germany. However, this doesn't tell the full story because China has many, many more people that are contributing to that GDP than Germany does. This is just the size of the population. So if we take into account the size of the population and divide total GDP by the population size, then we get per capita GDP. And we can see that when we take into account per capita GDP, Germany actually has a much larger per capita GDP than China. What does this mean? In general, China as a country produces a lot more output overall than Germany does. 
But on a per person basis, if we were to distribute that wealth across the population, the average person in Germany is much wealthier than the average person in China. In this um, slide, we have a lot of information. This table is ranking the world's economies by size according to GDP. So we're looking at the third column in 2016 total GDP measured in billions of dollars. And this table ranks countries from largest GDP all the way down to lowest GDP for the top 11 in the world. You can see that the United States has essentially the largest global economy, followed by China, followed by Japan. However, if we do, if we were to convert the information in the third column, total GDP, into per capita GDP as measured in US dollars, you can see that the ranking drastically changes. We still, on a per capita GDP basis, are the wealthiest economy in the world. But now you can see that second to us in that ranking is now Canada, followed closely by Germany. So <clears throat> what we um, wanna understand from this table is that total GDP and per capita GDP really give us two different pieces of information. So the um, distribution of GDP across the population of people is really going to give us a more nuanced view of what the average living standard is for an individual living in that economy. So that was the first way that we use GDP. The second purpose of GDP is to measure economic growth. Um, this helps us to understand how the average living standard changes in an economy over time. Um, so economic growth is going to be measured as a percent change in real per capita GDP over time. And if we want to be really accurate to understand the value of this measure, we have to adjust for inflation. Inflation is the situation in which the prices of things tend to go up over time, even though the quality of those goods haven't changed. So this is, um, inflation is measuring the growth and overall level of prices in an economy. So as the price level goes up, we call that inflation. In general, prices tend to rise over time. So if we don't take it this into account when we're measuring GDP for the purpose of looking at economic growth, then we're likely to overestimate increases in GDP. So what we call um, the price level is an index we use of the average prices of goods and services throughout the economy. Traditionally, this index um, is based around a center of 100. So if your price level is above 100, it means that prices have gone up. And if your price level is below 100, it means that prices have gone down. Um, so we create a measurement called the GDP deflator. The deflator is a measure of the price level and we use it to calculate real GDP. I'm gonna show you an example here in a second. The GDP deflator is a really broad price level index. Index meaning we create some kind of spectrum of numbers and give the maximum and minimum on that spectrum some meaning. And then therefore we could say, based on where you are in that spectrum, it tells us something about that measurement. This is like a general, an index. So GDP deflator is a price level index. And we use it to remove the factor of inflation from calculating real GDP. So let's look at an example. Nominal GDP is going to be the GDP measured in current prices not adjusted for inflation. 
real GDP, which is the measure that's more accurate and reflecting the true living standard of a country is going to adjust for those changes in prices. And so you can see that as prices tend to go up over time, real GDP is going to be less than nominal GDP because nominal GDP doesn't take into account that those prices go up. So when you're multiplying the quantity of output times the price it sells at, and that price is going up, it's going to look like the value of GDP is going up faster, but it's not because your output is going up faster, it's because those prices are going up. So if you remove the, the price change situation and we keep, um, we're able to control for prices, then we can get a better sense of how much output is going up with this inflation piece removed. So nominal GDP will always rise faster than real GDP. Real GDP is looking at just the, out, the value of the output piece, accounting for the fact that prices tend to go up over time. So here is an example of some um, nominal GDP measures and price levels for the period of time between 2009 and 2018. And you can see that nominal GDP here measured in billions of US dollars, this is just for the US, um, has in general gone up. But what we can see is like the price level has also gone up. And so we are um, wanting to account for this price level um, by using this piece of data, nominal GDP, and the relative price level, which is what we're gonna call the GDP deflator to calculate real GDP. So this is the first equation that I'm offering you. Unfortunately, or fortunately, I guess, this is something that you should just memor have memorized. This equation tells us the relationship between nominal GDP and real GDP. Specifically, real GDP is nominal GDP divided by the price level multiplied by 100. The multiplication does not make this value a percentage. It just converts the unit price into base year prices. Remember what I said where 100 was going to be the base year and anything above 100 is going upwards. Anything below 100 is going backwards. So when we divide the price by the price level, it's adjusting for inflation. Um, it helps us to compare levels of GDP over time by capturing the increases in GDP that are only due to changes in production, not due to inflation. So this is how we adjust um, nominal GDP into real GDP. We remove current prices by dividing by the, the price level. This then we take that amount and convert it into base year prices by multiplying by the base year price level, which is always 100. So let's look at an example here. If we wanted to find real GDP in the United States in 2008, how would we do that? This is what we're looking at. This is the table from a few slides ago. So we're looking at, I'm sorry, 2018, I think it said. Yes, 2018. Okay, so in 2018, our nominal GDP, so not accounting for inflation, was $20,500, but this is in billions. Um, and our price level was 110. So to calculate our real GDP, we would take nominal GDP and divide by the price level. So when we do that here, let me show that to you. So the time frame that we're looking at is 2018. We're gonna take nominal GDP, divide by the price level, and then multiply by 100. So real GDP is going to be $20,500 billion divided by a price level of 110. And then we multiply by 100, which is going to convert this to base year prices, which in our example, the base year was 2012. Let me go back to that table. You can see that the price level was 100 in the year 2012. So this, we're talking about 2012 dollars, like what the dollar was worth in 2012. 
when we do this, we get a real GDP for the year 2018 of $18,636 billion. And those dollars are 2012 dollars, the value of a dollar in 2012. So this accounts for any inflation that happened between 2012 and 2018. And this 18,000 billion dollars is the true value of the, of the output accounting for any change in prices. So let's practice this. What do we know about the difference between real GDP and nominal GDP? So real GDP is adjusted for inflation. Nominal GDP is measured in current prices. So even after adjusting for inflation, in our economy in the United States, we tend to see that real GDP is rising. Um, this is an example of economic expansion. So GDP per capita has risen on average um, during this period of time between the 1970s and the um, 2000 teens. On average, we've seen real GDP per capita rise by about 1.8% per year on average. Um, so what that means or what we can infer from this graph is that living standards have risen in the United States over the past 50 years even though growth itself was not positive every single year. So we can see that there's some cyclical nature to it, that there were dips in per capita GDP, but that the overall um, trend is an upward trend. So when we talk about standards of living, we're really looking at long run economic growth, um, the overall trend versus short run fluctuations. When we compare um, economic growth across nations, adjusting for population and inflation. So adjusting for population by putting it into per capita numbers, adjusting for inflation by taking nominal measurements and using the, the GDP deflator to convert it to real measurements. Then once we have real per capita GDP, we can make a meaningful comparison between nations. So this graph is measuring real per capita GDP in the base year of 1990. So we're looking at what the dollar was valued at in the year 1990. And we're looking at the period um, over between 1950 and 2016. So um, what we can see is happening here is that there's been definitely different periods of significant growth and different periods of significant decline for certain countries. Overall, um, we can see that like, for example, let's look at Liberia, which is the orange one down here. They had pretty stagnant economic growth from the 1950s through the 1990s. And then they actually saw economic contraction or a decrease in per capita real GDP um, in the 90s and early 2000s, and then they've leveled out again. Whereas we can see India, which is this um, kind of dark grayish blue color, they had stagnant um, economic activity up until the 80s. And then they began to experience moderate, not significant, but moderate economic growth into the 2000s. Um, where we're seeing a lot of economic growth is in countries like Mexico, Turkey, and Poland. Um, you can see that overall, they have a very positive trajectory, even though there's been dips at different periods of time. Um, and then unfortunately, we see a, a country like Nicaragua that actually had higher per capita GDP in the 1950s to the 1980s than they do today. Um, and this is often um, tied to stabilizing factors of the political economy um, and how an, econ uh, an economic system is run by the government forces that are in a position of power at that time. So like I said, we're looking at long run trends versus short term fluctuations. The short-term fluctuations though are not insignificant and they often occur in what we call a business cycle. This is a short run fluctuation around the long run trend. So even if an economy is expanding in the long run, it's pretty normal to go through periodic um, contractions in GDP. 
Typically, economic growth follows a pretty regular short run pattern of alternating between expansion and contraction, expansion and contraction. This is usually due to changes in employment, changes in productivity, changes in interest rates, which creates different incentives for saving versus spending. And these are all known as the business cycle. So a complete business cycle is the period of time that it takes to go from um, all the way through expansion and contraction. So expansion is where we're in a, we're currently in a trough or a low period, and then we reach a peak in GDP. And then, um, so during that period of time, during expansion, total production and total em employment increases. A contraction, often called a recession, is where you start at a peak in GDP and you go all the way down into the trough. This um, is a period of time where production and employment are decreasing. Um, ideally, business cycles are relatively easy to define. However, in real time, the phases of a business cycle are often hard to identify. This is data that's kept by the NBER, the National Bureau of Economic Research. Um, and they define, so these are the, the business cycle. Oh, sorry. They define a recession specifically as a significant decline in economic activity spread across the country that lasts for more than a few months, is visible in measuring real GDP, real income, employment, industrial production, and wholesale retail sales, okay? So economists often debate this definition, like what makes a contraction a recession and when is a contraction not totally a recession? Um, juries out on that, but usually it lasts more than a few months and is visible across all of those measures. Let's look at an example. So here is the short run path. This, these are business cycles. And we can see that peaks are high points, troughs are low points. And so the period between a peak and a trough is known as a contraction. The period between a trough and a peak is known as an expansion. So Overall, we see a upward long run trend in GDP, even though at individual periods in time, there may be periods of a downward trend. So if we were to look at actual US data between the 1970s and 2018, there have been, um, this is a plot of real GDP over time, um, with the contractionary periods shaded in blue, there have been six significant contractions in the US economy over the last 50 or so years, even though over the period of, of, of that same period of time, real GDP has more than tripled. So overall, real GDP is going up, but we've had periods of significant contraction. Um, one that's notably long and pronounced is what was known as the Great Recession. Um, Many of you might have been familiar with this in the year 2008. I don't know how old you were then. I was graduating from college then and during the Great Recession. And it was a period of time where employment was so low, it was next to impossible to find a job going out of college. So many people continued on their ed educational path, including myself. I think ideally I would have worked for a little bit before going to graduate school, but that really wasn't an option for me because we were in the great recession. And so I chose to go straight from my bachelor's degree into my master's degree, hoping it would get better by then. But as you can see, the Great Recession lasted a significant period of time. So when I finished my master's, I actually just went and continued on for my PhD um, because I knew that the prospects of getting a well-paying, benefited job were quite low. Um, this data stops in 2018. If it was to continue until present day, I believe that in 2020, 2020, we would see another contraction that is directly correlated with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and so it's still, we're only, you know, a year and a half into the pandemic. It's uncertain how long this period of contraction is going to last and whether or not the history books will actually label it a recession in the long run.
So that's where I'm going to stop for this first half of the lecture. It's a lot of information. And the most important thing here is that you recognize that there are different measures for how we look at GDP. There's total GDP, nominal GDP, which does not account for inflation. Then there's real GDP, which uses a GDP deflator or a price level to account for the inflation or the increase in prices over time. Real GDP is calculated as nominal GDP divided by that price level index um, multiplied by 100 to convert it into base year prices. Also, total GDP doesn't tell us the whole story because it really depends on the size of the population. So we can convert total GDP into per capita GDP by dividing by the size of the population. And this gives us a better idea of how wealth is distributed across an economy. Review these measures and specifically make note of the mathematical component here of how you calculate these measures and therefore can understand the relationship between them. Where we pick up, we're gonna look at the different individual components of GDP and how we measure them and what they include or not include. Um, so stay tuned for the next half of this lecture and I'll see you soon.